So hello, my name is George Cody. I'm an experimental geochemist and I've been asked to give a talk about metabolism. So I'm gonna share my screen right now and begin my talk. So um, <clears throat> I'm a, a staff scientist at uh, Earth and Planetary Laboratories of Carnegie Institution. Um, and I was asked to give a talk about metabolism. Um, and I think it's somewhat appropriate because I've been working on uh, as an experimental geochemist trying to understand how uh, the early Earth had the capacity to basically do abiotic synthesis that might have led to something with utility for the emergence of life. And a while back, I was asked by um, John Barrows and, and Woody Sullivan at the University of Washington to write a chapter on the subject, The Roots of Metabolism. I had the pleasure of writing this with uh, James Scott, who is an incredible microbiologist and very much a connoisseur if you will, of, of metabolism. And so we put together this chapter and we were challenged to write a chapter about metabolism for astronomers. <laughs> and so we, we set out to do this and I think we were successful. And in the very beginning, uh, this is a very James Scott sort of way of looking at things. We, we decided to not worry terribly about the definition of life and simply we noted that rather than define life, not by what it is, but, but what it does, and so what life does is scavenge natural energy and converts this to biological energy, which we'll refer to as ATP, and then uses ATP to make more of itself. Uh, so there are basically two aspects of metabolism. One is catabolism, the other is anabolism. Catabolism is the, the process by which um, metabolism converts energy to ATP, and it uses a number of protein enzyme, enzymes to do this. Anabolism is how metabolism basically takes its biological energy, links it to substrates, and makes cell structure biomass. And at the bottom here, we have a picture of, of the late James Scott, um, who's lost to science is, is tremendous. Let's see, I've got to try to advance this. So, there are two ways life makes ATP. Well, one is a substrate level phosphorylation, basically it uses ATP to make to ATP. So glucose metabolism, for example, yields two ATPs. And then there's electron transport phosphorylation, ETP, that uses electrons to make NADH to couple to an oxidant, say for example, oxygen. And one NADH uh, yields three ATPs. So, how does life do it? Well, don't focus too terribly on the details, but on the upper left, you start with glucose. In step one, you, you consume ATP and you convert glucose stepwise, <clears throat> ultimately to the far right, where you split it into two molecules. These two molecules then are capable of first making two moles of NADH, and then they can make one mole of ATP at step seven and another mole of ATP at step 10, leading to pyruvate. So you have a net gain of ATP, even though you start out consuming it. A pyruvate sits at the threshold of what's called the TCA cycle, um, which is the core of, of all metabolism. And when it runs in an oxidative sense, which is what I'm showing here, meaning it moves clockwise, it does two things. It produces more NADH here, some down, you can see my mouse here, and some NADH here and there. So it's, it's producing a, a huge amount of ATP, starting all the way from one mole of glucose. Uh, but it also is the center um, metabolic pathways to all the amino acids, membrane, lipids, uh, the purines, the pyrimidines, everything that, that is life comes out of the TCA cycle. So how to ATP is made, I won't go into detail, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a really elegant, uh, means of, of creating what's called a protomotive force. This is the Mitchell hypothesis. And the idea is if you can couple a, a electron donor to an electron acceptor, you can drive protons from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane, creating a pH gradient. And eventually the pH gradient <clears throat> will be such that protons will be forced through the only way they can get back in to the membrane to equilibrate the pH gradient through an enzyme complex called ATP synthase, which basically takes a molecule called ADP, and phosphorylates it to make ATP in water. So, so long as delta G is negative for any donor receptor pair, uh, this will work. Um, obviously, hydrogen and oxygen at room temperature has a very negative delta G. Uh, 
So it turns out there are many different redox couples available for life. Um, methanogens, for example, like CO2 and hydrogen, uh, from which they'll make methane and water. That's a thermodynamically favorable reaction. Some organisms breathe iron, uh, ferrous, uh, ferric iron, making ferrous iron. Some oxidize ferrous iron, making ferric iron. Some use couple methane with, you know, the oxidation of methane with sulfate to produce hydrogen sulfide. This is called anaerobic methane oxidation. And of course, hydrogen oxygen, the now gas reactions, is fine. Um, of course, where that's gonna happen, it turns out there are some places in the environment where that will happen. So basically, under any circumstances where delta G's negative metabolism will work. So as an experimental geochemist, I was very fascinated by the idea that how could this planet have a really robust capacity for abiotic synthesis? And the reason I say this, it may seem strange, um, given that we have life all around us, um, is, Basically, you have a fully differentiated body. So at the surface of Earth, in the absence of life currently, um, you have a highly oxidized crust, you have a highly oxidized mantle, and your electron donors, all your electrons more or less, are stored deep, deep within the Earth and the core. And so just from that standpoint alone, it, it would appear that extensive organic chemistry on Earth would be somewhat improbable. Now, it, it turns out a couple things happen that are, are sort of interesting. There's a really nice uh, review of, by Kevin Zonley, uh, comes to the conclusion that uh, developing a climate atmosphere and ocean on, on Earth was very likely. So the, the accretion of Earth was a very violent process. It, it led to a magma ocean, um, an absolutely sterilizing event for any, any organic matter that might have been carried into the accretion process. Um, so you can imagine that Earth started after maybe about a million years, essentially sterile, but with oceans, and then temperatures rapidly dropping. So then within about 10 million years, Kevin suggests that actually uh, it, it would have been quite climate on the surface of the Earth, even though the magma ocean may still be crystallizing at some great depth. Um, so what does life look like? Well. I'm a solid state nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopist, uh, in addition to an experimental geochemist. And one day I decided just to collect a C13 solid state MR spectrum of, of dry E. coli. And what this spectrum shows you is every single peak corresponds to a carbon in an electronic environment, a bonding environment um, across the board. And um, so what you see in this complex spectrum is in red, I've highlighted the carbon that's in protein, in blue, the carbon is glycogen, and black is, is essentially the total E. coli spectrum. And this allows us to get a very clear molecular picture of, of what life looks like. So it turns out for simple eukaryotic organisms, we're talking about 60-70% protein, 50% glycogen is, is a storage sugar, 11% lipids, which is your membrane, and then the remainder is, is largely rib ribosomal uh, RNA. Um, you know, just a small amount of DNA, but mostly it's ribosomal RNA. So one point to take note of is that the chemistry, the <clears throat> carbon, of course, exists over eight different valence states, from minus four, the most reduced, to plus four, the most oxidized. And if you were a methanogen combining CO2 with hydrogen to form biomass, biomass is always going to be at about zero valence. And this turns out to be a very good place for abiotic chemistry to, to find itself. And I would point you to papers, classic papers by Art Weber, where he makes this point rather uh, eloquently, that being around carbon zero is, is where you want to find yourself. For example, methane is way down here, alkanes are here, lipids would be down here at minus two. So while they're important to uh, membrane function, the interesting chemistry is really occurring up here around valence zero. One of the things that's interesting about that is that you're in the valence zero region of, of carbon's valence uh, spectrum. Uh, you have the possibility of polymerizing even with at high activities of water. So if you were, for example, trying to polymerize uh, reduced carbon through Fischer-Tropf chemistry, that doesn't work very well when the activity of water gets even slightly substantial. And so that would terminate pretty quickly here. But things like sugar condensation via outlaw polymerization presumably and principally can go on almost at any activity of water. They just become kinetically sluggish. Um, and then Irina Mamachanov um, has done some really beautiful studies and you heard um, Ram talk about these Stepsy uh, peptides where they, um, they're they able to basically make fairly large polymers of, of peptides and, and uh, esters uh, 
up to you know quite high water activities through wet dry cycling. So what if we want life to emerge in a world with surface water, what is the minimum we think must have occurred? Well, we would argue, or I would argue, that at the minimum, the Earth had to have had been able to develop environments where dynamic organic reaction networks were stable and sustained. Are there any obvious places on Earth where this is true currently uh, without life? No, no, there doesn't seem to be. Um, however, has there been any evidence of dynamic organic reactions ever occurring naturally? Uh, actually, they have. And it's actually, a, it's a beautiful study by um, George Cooper, as I'll show you, that identified, uh, my view, clear evidence of, a, of an, an extinct dynamic organic reaction network occurring in the interior of a planetesimal. So this is a primitive um, chondritic meteorite. They're undifferentiated bodies, they get quite wet. Um, they are derived from worlds that existed for tens of hundreds or up to hundreds of millions of years. Um, they have interiors that provide an environment where prebiotic synthesis plausibility is a known fact. So the environment is warm, not hot. It's wet, not soaked. It's initially far from the equilibrium. It had interstellar ices, metals, and hydrosilicates, etc., and and even uh, some primitive organic matter formed in interstellar ices. It's relatively rich in reduced carbon, has catalytic phases, iron nickel metal, and iron sulfide troilite and potentially millions of years of mild hydrothermal reaction. So George Cooper published in 2011 a beautiful study where he identified a number of common metabolic intermediates per, uh, present in extracts from the Murchison meteorite. And he imagined that they all came through a common precursor pyruvate. So these are the uh, classic metabolic intermediates that you might find, say, for example, the TCA cycle. He also identified some non-metabolic intermediates that I'll come back to that are quite interesting. So he envisioned an immediate explosion of molecular complexity, but aqueous alteration of the Murchison parent body lasted upwards of tens of millions of years. And most compounds detected are unstable in warm water. They have very short half-lives. Virtually none of these compounds would be expected to live hundreds to 10,000 years. Oxaloacetate wouldn't survive a day. Um, so this requires that these compounds that are clearly identified in the Murchison extract represent a continuous and replenishing dynamic organic reaction network. Uh, this is, in my view, the, the holy grail of abiotic organic chemistry, and George Cooper uh, detected uh, an extinct such system. So getting back to metabolism, um, carbon fixation is, is, is a very interesting aspect of the problem, uh, so how you're going to have to build uh, you know, essentially molecular complexity from simple precursors. And so here's an example of how methanogens do it. They, as I said, they feed off of CO2 and hydrogen, and they follow what's called the Wood-Lundahl pathway, or the acetyl-CoA pathway, which is a really elegant thing. So there's a western branch, we call it the methyl branch, and the, I mean the eastern branch, the methyl branch, and the western or carbonyl branch. And what you end up doing is stepwise reduction of CO2 down to a methyl group, on, on a cofactor here, which is called tetrahydrofolate. Um, this can be cleaved off, forming methane and ATP as a consequence. So this is an energy generator. Or you can transfer the methyl group to a cobalt cofactor and bring it over to the western branch, where you do a carbonyl insertion reaction, forming ultimately acetyl-CoA, from which you can form ATP, if you acetate an ATP, or you can go on to form biomass by pumping it into the TCA cycle. Um, if you take a closer look, what's interesting in the Western branch is that the key active site of the acetyl-CoA synthetase complex is a nickel iron sulfur cluster, which I've highlighted here. It's a, it's a ferrodoxin with a nickel hanging off the side. And what happens is this cluster will do two things. First, it will carbonylate the iron, and then a methyl group on a cobalt cofactor will be transferred to the nickel center where the carbonyl insertion reaction occurs. Then this can go on to form biomass, as, as I just said. Um, again, just a picture of, of how nickels and iron are discreetly involved in this chemistry. And um, so there you have it. In the absence of methanogens in life, um, the Earth did provide catalytic opportunities in the form of transition metal sulfides, so pyrite here, calcopyrite, and sphalerite. Um, 
So how do these form? How do these arise? It turns out if you homogenize the bulk silicator completely, uh, you would have no transition metal sulfides. So, so what you have to do is extract them. And the way you extract them is through extensive water rock interaction. And this can occur, for example, at hydrothermal spreading centers uh, across the ocean floor. Example, and this has occurred over geologic time back into the Archean, um, that giant massive sulfide deposits can form through extensive water rock interaction. Uh, this is an example of one, the Tag hydrothermal mound, where you have something like 2 billion kil kilograms of, of transition metal sulfide ore. Um, but just to highlight, enormous amounts of water rock interactions are required to enrich uh, the transition metals to the point where you can form pure sulfides. We got interested in whether natural sulfides could produce, uh, could, could uh, catalyze uh, carbonyl insertion reactions, much as you see in, in living systems in the uh, acetyl-CoA synthesis pathway. And in fact, they're very good catalysts. Nickel sulfide and uh, hazelwoodite, another nickel sulfide, are, are fantastic. This is co co uh, cobalt sulfide. In fact, most of this range of sulfides we saw all showed decent catalytic activity. And these, these are very good catalysts. Uh, the only one that didn't was copper sulfide on the far right. But I highlight um, both copper sulfide and then the C1 plus uh, copper sulfide that they, they actually were good catalysts in other ways. So they were two of the best catalysts, for example, to promote the reduction of carbonyl group, uh, you know, carbonyl groups on the, the catalyst surface to methyl groups, which were then transferable. And similarly, uh, they were very good for forming thioether linkages from the substrate. So the transition metal sulfides are, are basically doing abiotic wood lundahl type metabolic carbon fixation. So we got excited about whether or not this would open up a possibility or a pathway, abiotic pathway, um, from simple compounds like propene down here to the citric acid cycle. In other words, getting yourself into intermediary metabolism and around carbon valence zero sort of thing. And so we envision something like this. Uh, the beta pathway I highlight is, is the hydrothermal decomposition pathway for citrate. So we just simply wanted to see if we could reduce that um, with these transition metal sulfide catalysts. So we ran an experiment and it works. So we could take, for example, methacrylic acid, and this is formic acid, a source of CO and water or CO2 and hydrogen over nickel monosulfide, and we make a dicarboxylic acid group. This is methyl succinic. Similarly, we could take a dicarboxylic acid like idaconic acid, do the same reaction, and form a tricarboxylic acid. This is called tricarboxylic acid. So we got pretty excited that this would occur naturally on the planet, and it opened up our eyes to the idea that this is probably, in our view, the, the most likely small molecule pathway towards pre-biochemistry, if you will. And it, the key here, um, going over the details quite quickly, is that it requires both reducing and oxidizing conditions simultaneously which is not the kind of experiment you would typically do or could easily do in the laboratory. Uh, but we imagine that there are environments or were environments, both in the carbonaceous chondrate and also in the early earth, where you could have had uh, sort of kinetically inhibited disequilibrium between both oxidizing species and reduced species. And that would afford the kind of chemistry that would lead you level by level up to considerable molecular complexity. So here we have aspartate, pyrimidines are possible. We showed this in the laboratory. Histidine we haven't shown, but it looks like it should be possible. Um, amino acids like glycine, serine, cysteine, et cetera. It's also a very effective generator of pyruvic acid. If you went up one more level in, in carbonyl insertion, you would get to citric acid. Um, pyruvic acid has been shown to be a very easy way to generate alanine and so on and so forth. So uh, this is kind of what we envision. Uh, the prebiotic pathway with carbon fixation leading to molecules that would have some facility for life. So it's, it's important to stress a lot can form from a little. So for example, if you start with butanoic acid, nice butanoic acid, and allow for the following reactions, uh, carbonyl insertion reducing under reducing conditions, partial oxidation under oxidizing conditions, retroaldal cleavage reactions, which are neutral, but the great source of, of keto acids like pyruvate, Aldol condensation is a neutral reaction. And then amination and reductive amination, one is neutral and the other is, is reducing. But if you took these two simple molecules and did a, a Gedanken experiment, imagine you can do all of these things, you can easily generate the excess of 350 molecules 
um, just starting with two little molecules. So, so the, the propensity of this, this suite of reactions to create molecular complexity is very high. So going back to what uh, the molecules that, that George Cooper discovered in Murchison, we've discovered in, in various experiments. So, but we don't see them radiating from pyruvate, rather we connect them through these pathways. And ultimately, uh, even recently, uh, alpha ketoglutarate is, 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 a, is a product that, that we've shown you can get to, and others have, have explored this in much greater detail, including Ram Krishnamurtha. Um, so the question is, is this what occurred in the Murchison parent body as part of its dynamic organic reaction network? I, I think it is. I think it's strong evidence for that. So. It appears that abiotic chemistry is ubiquitous, given similar environmental parameters. So why did life emerge on Earth and apparently not on a chondritic parent body? And the easy answer is, I don't know. Uh, but reality, there are some differences. A carbonaceous chondrite, um, when it undergoes aqueous alteration in its interior, it, it's a, it's a one-shot pathway. It, it starts well out of equilibrium and it drifts towards some sort of equilibrium and it, it drifts in one direction and it doesn't go forever. Um, however, plate tectonics created a, a very novel environment and it's a recursive environment and it's been consistent for four and a half billion years on this planet. So abiotic chemical chemistry on Earth seems like it probably was localized, has to be uh, access to catalysts and um, it seems like water rock interactions via tectonics generates continuous disequilibrium. So it, it's kind of like emergent organic chemistry on a treadmill. Uh, what I mean by this is if, if, if you were trying to generate life and you didn't succeed, you just could carry it off to the abyssal waste plan, wasteland and innovation against progressive alterations rewarded with fresh substrate. So continuous opportunities to invent, fail if you die, but if you succeed, it's a continuous source of, of free energy and catalytic phases like nickel, cobalt, copper, iron, which are critical. So this is uh, my last slide. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a, my view about where we are as experimental, experimentalists in addressing these questions. I think we're, we're well on our way with um, simple abiotic chemistry. I think we see the possibilities for, I would call enhanced abiotic chemistry by using the use of various natural catalysts, as I showed you earlier. Uh, different catalysts can catalyze different reactions. Um, where things start to get difficult is in perhaps the next stage of, of whatever happened, and that would be this idea of system chemistry, um, and in particular, the idea of a system developing autocatalysis. Uh, there has been some work in this area, uh, but I think uh, it's really just to scratch the surface. And, and from the standpoint of, of putting this in an Earth-centric point of view, I think we're really far to go. But that's not nearly as far to go as we have to go, because where I think um, things become critical, and this goes back to Ram's talk, is, is the idea that at some point you, you need to develop the apparatus for translation and for replication and for, for storing um, essentially genetic information. Uh, and so one can imagine this developing in some way, and that's what I'm trying to cartoon here, and what you can imagine is an embedded RNA peptide catalyst system in a landscape of abiotic organosynthesis. So more a linking of metabolism with, with translation and information. Um, don't know what I would call this, but it'd be life. Uh, it'd be more like a kind of a chemical complex ecosystem, but not an individual. And from an experimental point of view, this would be probably completely intractable. Uh, the complexity would be just too much to follow at all what was going on as, as Ram discussed beautifully in his talk. But what can imagine is that this would be the sort of point where the transformation from a complex chemical ecosystem could evolve individuality and with individuality, the in innovation of DNA, because you have to now incorporate this complex ecosystem inside individuals. Um, it seems obvious or seems reasonably obvious that the first metabolic chemistry would be would be mixotrophy because you'd be emerging in an environment that's capable of a lot of abiotic synthesis. Um, and then finally, you get to life as we know it begins. The phylogenetic tree is, is so-called rooted and life uh, spins out from that to 
all of this glory. So that's all I have to say about that. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to stop recording.